Well, thanks for the very nice introduction, and uh, it's a great visit. It's a beautiful campus. I really enjoyed. So yeah, so as Alan said, I will discuss um, some recent results uh, we obtained in my group working on uh, memory and the computing uh, systems based on a, a new type of device, or relatively new type of device. Uh, it's based on an effect called resistive switching. And more specifically, uh, these are quite interesting devices. So they are electronic devices, kind of like a transistor, or uh, to be more exact, they even look like a, a resistor, but they actually have some very interesting behavior which are driven by um, the controlled migration of ions. Uh, so I will discuss how this happens. So I'll start with a slide pro probably everybody knows, so I don't have to introduce this. So we all know that the semiconductor industry is driven by its Morse law. We have been doubling the transistor count every two years, and uh, that's basically, that's the only thing the semiconductor industry knows, right? If you go to a, uh, um, for example, a, uh, a conference by the semiconductor co connector companies, the only thing they will know how to sell you a product is by selling you a better product at a lower price, right? So unlike a lot of other businesses, this is the only way the semiconductor companies know how to survive. But uh, if you just look at the scaling trend, you will see that Moore's Law actually is still going very well. People are seeing there are all kinds of challenges with Moore's Law, but Moore's Law is actually still, um, in the near future, it will not, um, it will continue to survive. It will not have a, a lot of problem. You see the transistor count still doubles every two to three years, okay? But on the other hand, the performance of the, 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 uh, the CPU, the performance of the chips you get, are no longer increase linearly as the transistor count, okay? So this is basically, for example, this is a single thread performance. Uh, you will see it saturates uh, around 2005, and the frequency, uh, the operation frequency of the chip also saturates, and uh, uh, the power a chip consumes also kind of saturates. That's limited by physical parameters. So if you continue to increase the power, you'll start to melt the chips. But the other performance saturation, the speed of the, uh, the chip doesn't increase anymore. So even though you keep packing more transistors per chip, you don't really get the performance gains uh, you expect. Uh, that's basically because uh, the so-called memory wall. So you can have very fast logic, but you, you have to retrieve the data from a separate memory, and you only have limited bandwidth between your logic and the memory. Uh, so that makes things very, very inefficient. So we no longer see the performance gain we used to see, uh, for example, in the last 30 years. So right now, just by increasing the number of transistors, making the transistors smaller, actually doesn't really help you that much anymore. So in some sense, people are really interested in uh, new ways to do computing, so new state variables, rather than using a uh, uh, turning on and off a transistor and uh, attracting data from a separate memory, maybe you can have uh, some other devices where we can maybe combine memory and the logic together so we, don't, we can get rid of this memory wall. And if you can do that, we can also make things very efficient so we can get rid of this so-called heat wall. And that's basically uh, why people are very interested in these new emerging devices. So this relative switching device is one of the more promising devices. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, so they look very simple. So from the outside, they look just like a resistor. That's the first element we learned uh, even in primary school, right? This is the first electronic dev device we learned. So uh, this is also the simplest device. For any device to work, you need electrodes. You need two electrodes, one to send a signal, the other to collect the signal. So this device is nothing but two electrodes sandwiching a, a so-called switching film. So it's very simple. So because it's so simple, uh, you can get a very high density. So we can build this called crossbar structure. So all you have are just arrays of electrodes. So you have an array of top electrodes and an array of bottom electrodes. And at each cross point, you have this device structure. You have two electrodes sandwiching a film. So this film is resistive, okay, it's not metal. So, so then you can have a resistance between the two electrodes. So then this is just a resistor. So obviously you can get a high density resistor, which is trivial, which doesn't really do computing. So this device, uh, the, the nice thing is that they, they are much more than a resistor. So even though they, from the outside, they offer the benefit of a resistor. It give you very high density, very easy to integrate. But somehow this device provides a so-called memory effect. Uh, so that uh, this is a typical device IV curve. So normally the resistance may be high. Uh, so it's a very good uh, resistor with high resistance. But above a certain threshold voltage, you can change the device resistance. Now you can move the device to a different resistance with a low resistance, so now you have a different uh, slope IV, in your IV curve, okay? So the device can maintain 
this new resistance, okay? So that gives you a memory effect. So in this way, you can uh, build a memory, right? Now we can have a memory device at each cross point. So this gives me a very high density memory. But more than that, later on we'll see that this resistive element can also be used directly to do computing. Uh, that's because through simply Ohm's law, um, this resistance can modulate current flow. So if I apply a voltage here, the current flowing through this device is dependent on the voltage multiplied by the resistance, okay? So in this way, the memory state you stored here can directly be used to process data. You don't have to retrieve a memory and process it somewhere else. You can directly process the information through the memory, memory cell, okay? That also makes the computation very efficient. So that's basically the idea. So how does the device provide the memory, okay? So, uh, so that's where the ionic part comes in. So as we discussed, if it's just a resistor, it's not useful. Uh, so in this case, uh, what happens is that at a high enough electric field, um, so the voltage doesn't have to be very high um, because the film can be very thin. So these films now we build, uh, say, two nanometers, okay? So even if you only apply one volt, you can build a field several uh, megavolt per centimeter. So that's very high electric field. So at this very high electric field, what can happen is that you can physically move the ions uh, in the dielectric field, okay? So normally we consider we have ions. We have ions in our conventional transistors. They are dopants, but they don't move, okay? Once you build them, you don't move the ions anymore. In fact, we assume the ions will never move. We are only applying a gate to attract more electrons and less electrons. That's how we turn on and off a transistor. But here, the device resistance is measured by electric current. So you still use the current to measure the resistance, but you change the resistance by changing the ionic distribution, okay? Even in a conventional dielectric. So later on, I will show that even in a very good, the best insulator, silicon dioxide, you can still move ions in uh, this material, uh, in this very conventional semiconductor material at this high electric field and at very con in a very controlled fashion. So, so there are actually turned out to be two types of device that can give you this kind of effect. One, uh, some people call it electrochemical metallization cell or ECM, or some people call it conductive bridge uh, resistive random access memory, so CBRAM, okay? Uh, so what happens is that you have a conventional insulator, like silicon dioxide, okay, very conventional insulator. Uh, you put a so-called active metal electrode, for example, silver, okay? So you put a silver electrode here, and the bottom electrode is inert. What happens is that if you apply a positive voltage on the silver electrode, you can ionize silver atoms into silver ions. You can physically strip electron from silver atom and convert this into a silver ion. And this silver ion will migrate at this electric field, okay? And it will eventually capture another electron near the cathode and become reduced. So you can move the ion over some distance. And in this way, over time, you can accumulate enough silver in this silicon dioxide and form a so-called filament. So now I train the resistance from the best insulator. So silicon dioxide is obviously the best insulator we have found, and to a very good conductor because now the current flows through this uh, filament, okay? So in this sense, when you program the device, you physically train the material. So I'm not just training the electron contribution, I'm physically reconfiguring the material. So in this case, I physically created a new material in silicon dioxide. I moved the silver into this silicon dioxide, so I physically create a new material, which didn't exist before. And uh, you can reset, you can remove this filament by applying a reverse polarity, then you can oxidize, you can convert these atoms into ions, and you can deposit it on the other electrode. Now you can break this filament, okay? So nice thing about this film is that because silicon doesn't, uh, silver doesn't react with silicon, there's no silver silicide. So silver stays as silver, silicon stays as silicon. So there's no chemical reaction in this way. So I can completely remove silver in this region. So I can fully recover this nice insulator property. So I can start from a very good insulator, I can get a very good metallic or high conductance, then I can fully recover this very nice insulator property, okay? So I can cycle this uh, in a controlled fashion many times. So that's how I, have, I can store data. So this state has a low resistance, that's my one. This state has a high resistance, that's my zero, okay? So I get a very large off ratio between the ones and zeros. So that's one type of device. Another type of device based on a similar principle, but instead of using uh, external ion, uh, in this case, a silver ion in silicon, 
or silicon dioxide, uh, they use an in internal ion. For example, uh, you can have um, uh, a tantalum pentoxide, which is a good insulator. Once again, people use it as a high-k material. Um, but if you have some oxygen vacancy, so here I represented it by the dots. So if you have some oxygen vacancies, the oxygen vacancies act as dopants. They are n-type dopants. So if you have those oxygen vacancies, they make the film conducting because you have dopants. Then if you deposit two films, one is um, this stoichiometric hafnium uh, uh, hafnium or tantalum pentoxide. The other is this oxygen deficient or oxygen vacancy rich film. Then initially, the overall stack is insulating because this film is insulating. But now if I apply a, a positive voltage on the top, the oxygen vacancies, they are donors, they are positively charged. I can push the positively charged donors into this ins insulating layer, okay? Now I can make the whole stack conducting, okay? So once again, I can switch between the one and zero states. Um, so the reverse priority, I can apply negative voltage here. I can move the donors uh, away from the insulating layer and then recover this insulating state. Uh, so this is another type. So this is basically some people call it oxide-based RM or valency change cell because when you're training the oxygen vacancy concentration, you are training the metal uh, ions valency state. So you can train the, you basically train the stoichiometry. So once again, you are physically reconfiguring the material. It's no longer the same material. It's changed from a tantalum, a tantalum pentoxide into a suboxide during this operation. And this is all done in situ after you build the devices, after you build the circuits, I can still train the material property in situ. So not only do I train the electrical property, uh, you can also train the field's uh, magnetic property, optical property, because you are physically training the Training the physical, you are training the chemical composition of the film on the fly. So this film uh, also offers a lot of advantages. The one drawback of this device is that because the oxygen vacancy is native, uh, it's a native defect. So once you introduce this oxygen vacancy in the switching layer, uh, so we call this layer the switching layer, uh, then it's very hard to completely remove it. So once you have these defects there, you can it's it's difficult to completely remove them. So your off state. It's no longer completely like this. You always have some oxygen vac vacancies left. So the off-state becomes somewhat leaky. So your on ratio is not very high. And while this film, because there's no chemical reaction, you can completely remove the silver and you can recover your very nice insulating state. Okay, so each type of device actually gives you somewhat different performance. So, uh, so this is a principle. This is a actually series. This is a hypothesis. Uh, we actually... Uh, we actually uh, did some TM analysis, institute TM analysis, actually found indeed that's the case. So this is a, a silver electrode. This is a little device structure, just make it easier to see the filament. So after programming, what you can see that this is a silicon dioxide layer. You can indeed form this silver-based um, uh, filament inside the silicon dioxide, okay? And if you zoom in, you can do some characterization of these particles, you will see this is a, Elemental silver, it's even crystalline silver particle, so it's really elemental silver. It doesn't form a silicide, as we discussed earlier. So when you reset, you can completely re recover, remove the silver from this uh, silicon, or at least a portion of that. So once you remove a portion of the filament, obviously you break the conduction, so you can already reset the device. So, uh, so that's interesting. So we published this paper, there was, still, there was a lot of interest, and people were still confused. How can you really move these particles, right? These are very large particles. How can you physically move them in silicon, in a solid state film, right? This is not in liquid where you can move ions or uh, polymers or those conventional dielectrics where, or, or conventional electrolytes where you can easily move ions. So how can you move these ions? Uh, so we did another study um, where we embed a silver particle. So just to make things really clear, so we embed this silver particle inside the silicon dioxide. Then we slice it up. So, so this particle is completely covered by silicon dioxide. Then we deposit the two electrodes here. Um, so then we apply a voltage. So we apply a positive voltage here and negative voltage there. Okay? So this particle sees nothing. It's not physically connected to anything. So it only sees this electric field. So now if we um, watch this evolution of the particle in real time, what you can see is that uh, if you watch this particle, you will see hopefully over time, you will see that over time, this particle start to become smaller and smaller. And it doesn't become smaller. It doesn't move uniformly. Obviously, there's no place for it to move. But it will start to lose atoms on this side. Because if you apply positive voltage here, negative voltage there, the particle is also polarized. It will be positive here and negative there. And it will start to lose atoms on the so-called anode side. Because on the anode side, 
uh, it start to ionize, okay? You see, uh, so you start to lose particle, this part start to get smaller and smaller, and a new particle start to emerge downstream along the electric field direction. So what happens is that, obviously you can't move the whole particle. What happens is that you are really moving atoms one by one. So you ionize one atom, then this atom becomes a super ion. It will move some distance. In this case, it happens to capture electron within the field and get trapped there. So then it will start at the nucleation set for additional atoms to deposit on it. So you, have, you lose electron, uh, you, you lose an um, uh, atom, it ionizes and be, uh, travel some distance, then become radio. So over time, eventually this original particle will disappear and this new particle start to emerge. So, so in this sense, it's really, really uh, interesting. So it's a solid state device at room temperature, but we are really controlling the at atoms one by one, okay? So people have been starting, uh, have talked about building electronics based on single atoms, right? People use uh, scanning tunneling microscopes at very low temperature to move atoms one by one. Um, so here we are also uh, moving atoms individually and we are controlling the electrical property individually, but we do it at room temperature and in, inside a, a circuit. So, so you, but you can control the film property, you can control the device resistance in situ using this approach. And because we are not really providing a lot of current through the device, so this is completely field driven. So you can actually do it in a very well controlled fashion. You, you are only moving atoms individually. So you can cycle the device many times, okay? So you not only can you move silver, you can also move a lot of other materials uh, depending on how easily you can um, ionize uh, the atom. So copper is next easy uh, compared to silver and uh, even inert materials like platinum, if you give it elect enough electric field, you can ionize it and move the atoms, okay? But obviously we stick with silver and copper because they require much lower field and they require much lower voltage to work with. So the other question is that how fast can you move the ions, right? Normally we consider ions to be very slow. That's why when you move them to this lo location, they form this filament. The filament can stay there for years. It gives you this memory property. But during programming, you want to move them fast. Uh, so, uh, so that's a challenge, right? How do you move them fast? Well, after programming, you want the, the, the ions to stay there forever. Uh, so Exactly, we are taking advantage of this property of the very low mobility of the ions, so they have very good memory. But during programming, the ion migration uh, no longer follow this linear drift uh, field uh, dependence. So normally, you, if you write down drift velocity of a particle, obviously it's proportional to the electric field. But when you apply such a high electric field, what happens is that, so this is a potential barrier, this is a potential profile for the ion to move from one location to another, that's the activation energy, right? When you apply a high enough field, you basically add a Coulomb energy to this, to this original potential. Uh, so you have this linear dependence, okay? So you add this Coulomb potential here, then you essentially you tilt this potential profile. So then, uh, then the active energy for this ion is actually reduced. Uh, so the effective, actually, uh, effective barrier for this um, ion migration is linearly dependent on the field. So then the speed, uh, is then exponentially improved because the probability of the ion hopping over the barrier is the exponential function of the barrier height. Now we reduce the barrier height by the electric field, you can exponentially speed up the programming speed. So indeed, if we measure the programming speed as a function of applied voltage, and this is proportional to the field, you will see you don't get a linear relationship, you get this exponential relationship. That's why you can program the device, say, at three volts, but then, um, if you have very low voltage or if you have no voltage, you can program them uh, at three volts, you can program them within 10 nanoseconds. But if you have no voltage or have, at the low voltage to read the device, the device state is maintained over years, okay? Because it's extremely nonlinear dependence on the speed and the energy profile. So obviously this is only true at high field. In fact, if the field is low, you do a tidal expansion of this term, you recover the linear uh, drift velocity and the electric field dependence. But at high field, you get this exponential a speed up of the ion velocity. So with that, you can build actual devices. So we build some actual devices. You can test the device performance. As we said, you can switch on the device at a few volts. And if you look at the off state and on state, so off state, you can have very good insulator behavior. So off state it can be, current can be only a few femtoamps, really, really low current, below one picoamp, okay? So your on state, even if it's a few nanoamps, you get more than three orders of magnitude. If you go to microamps, you get six orders of magnitude in off ratio. So this, this makes a, a, 
a very good memory device. Then you, the device can be cycled. Um, in this case, we showed you can cycle it over 100 million cycles. Okay, so you can program the device from low resistance state to the high resistance and uh, reset it and do this for many, many cycles. Okay, um, so uh, you can also integrate them on silicon. So this is an earlier product uh, uh, project uh, sponsored by DARPA. Uh, so we build this crossbar array on top of silicon. Um, circuit. So these are not integrated at the pad level. These are directly integrated through the CMOS VS. So these are very high density. You can actually see them here. They are very high density uh, local VS. So we can directly integrate the device um, on top because the device fabrication doesn't require a high temperature process. So you can, uh, all the processes are low temperature. So uh, the CMOS is not affected. So the CMOS underneath is not affected by the, um, the RM array fabrication. Uh, so you can store data, this is a small array, 40 by 40, then we can store an image here, and uh, uh, then you can write every one, uh, every zero to one, every one to zero, just to show we have, in this case, a uh, very good yield, so 100% yield, and you have very large on ratio between the two device states. Um, yeah, so, uh, so this, this is basically the, the basic operation of the device. So in the next, I'll discuss the potential applications. So, uh, so there are many different ways, as we discussed. We want to bring the memory close to logic, or ideally we want to perform computing directly through memory, right? So there are different ways to do that. Um, so first is that you can still use your conventional architecture. You can still use the way uh, you used to build computers. But now we, we can integrate this high-density memory directly on your logic chip, which uh, great, greatly reduces the bottleneck, because now this integration is very high the bandwidth between your memory and the logic is very high density. Uh, it's much larger than having a separate chip with some um, uh, buses between them. Okay. But you can also have other approaches where you can directly perform computation using these resistive devices, as we discussed, because the resistance stores the data and also processes the data simultaneously. So you can take advantage of that to perform so-called neuromorphic computing or uh, e-memory arithmetic computing. I'll discuss uh, some approaches here, and finally I'll go through a concept we recently de developed where we can make this system really reconfigurable to make it a, a more general purpose. So, uh, so the first approach, um, so this is, the, uh, uh, this is the lowest hanging fruit in some sense. So we already have the memory, we can integrate it with uh, the CMOS, so we're able to convince some VCs, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, we founded this company uh, in 2010, and we have gone through four rounds of um, uh, VC funding and uh, so far attracted of, uh, uh, over 100 million um, US dollars funding to date. So we have um, about 60 employees. Uh, the company is in Silicon Valley. So this is actually real. So this is no longer a project at the university. This is a real 12 inch wafer fabricated at a 40 nanometer node. Uh, so this is one of the largest foundries. This is not a small fab. This is one of those billion foundries actually producing our products okay. uh, in, uh, in silicon. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, one of the uh, products uh, cut open. Okay, so this is already being offered. Already we have um, pretty major customers uh, using this in their uh, in their eventual products. Okay, um, so this is a memory, but still you have this um, uh, separate memory and logic. But the idea that you have the memory really close to logic. For example, you can have this memory directly on top of the logic, so you can increase bandwidth. So you can have this so-called super hot data and uh, somewhat slower memory, uh, which give you an even higher density. I will not go into the details. There are some differences between those two uh, configurations, but one, one is somewhat faster, the other is somewhat slower. But in any way, they can both be integrated on chip, so you can get very, very high density uh, integrated memory on the order of gigabytes. Right now, it's, for example, your yeah, SRAM is, uh, is, say, 50 kilobytes, or like, uh, definitely less than one megabyte. So now we can do uh, gigabytes of integrated memory, which is very fast and uh, high density. And, uh, uh, and which will uh, significantly reduce the bandwidth between your memory and logic, okay? So that's the lowest hanging fruit, okay? Uh, uh, so the next interesting idea uh, is uh, to use the device, use the same memory device to directly do computing, okay? That actually, we already have an example. That's how our brain functions, right? So, uh, uh, so in our brain, for example, you can consider it as a computing system we have very slow devices, right? The neurons, they fire on the order of 10 hertz, extremely slow, right? But we can function very, very efficiently. When I see, probably I recognize him 
in a few clock cycles, right? I don't have to go through a, a supercomputer, run many, many cycles to recognize him. Uh, that's because we have a very parallel system, right? We have about 10 billion neurons in our brain, but each neuron is connected to 10,000 other neurons, okay? So this is very highly parallel. In contrast, in conventional CMOS, one transistor is connected to a few other transistors. So here, it's connected to 10,000 other uh, neurons. And the connection is not fixed. So this neuron is connected to another neuron through this connection called a synapse, right? The synapse has a weight. So weight is very, very important. That's where we store memory, and that's where we do computation. So for example, I see Pavli, and uh, some of my neurons fire, right? This neuron fire, and this signal is going to be propagated to another neuron. And how strong this neuron affects the next neuron is dependent on this weight, on this connection strength uh, between the two neurons. Uh, so if they are strongly connected, then this neuron can easily, efficiently transmit information to the other one and call the other one to fire, okay? Uh, that's how I recognize the pattern. If they are weakly connected, then uh, they will not cause, it will not cause the other neuron to fire. That's why I don't recognize the pattern, right? So, that's, so this connection strength, the pattern of the connection strength over this uh, 10,000 neurons around one neuron and over this 10 billion neurons in general uh, is where we store data, where we store data. This data is not stored at one neuron, it's stored at the pattern of the connections. And also how we process data very efficiently, okay, because we do this in parallel. And if you look at this, this device is a two-terminal device, right? This synapse is a two-terminal device. It connects one device with another with a weight, which in our case, you can use a resistance to represent the weight. So you can in some sense argue this synapse is a biological version of this memory star we discussed. It's um, a resistive device. In this case, the resistance is reflected at the weight with a memory effect, okay? We, once I've seen a person several times, I will train the connection between some neurons that's doing training, so this connection can be strengthened. The next, I, next time I see the same pattern, this neuron will fire together. And uh, over time, some connections may be lost. So these connections are resistive, but they also need to be updated. They need to have a memory effect. They can be updated on, f on the fly. So this can be exactly emulated uh, by this memory star device we discussed. It's two terminal, it has a weight. Uh, you can, it has a memory effect in the weight. You can, you can update the effect on the fly. So with this approach, you can build, you can map this uh, neuromorphic, this neural network to this crossbar, same crossbar structure we discussed earlier. Okay, you can have this crossbar structure. Now these are your artificial neurons. So these are silicon components. We use them to emulate neurons. Then this neuron will send a voltage signal. That's your spike. Then it will down through this memory star, the synapse, and this, the, the, and it's converted to a current. This signal is converted to current. And how large current this neuron collect is then depends on the voltage spike and the resistance. Uh, so that's how we can emulate this biological network with this crossbar network, okay? So this turned out to be a very nice um, system to implement this uh, bio-inspired computing hardware system. So, uh, so for this, we use this oxide-based device because they allow us to um, gradually train the conductance. We don't want to just train the conductance from zero to one. We want to gradually train the, uh, the connection strength. That's how we learn things in biology as well. You don't want learning to be very fast. It will not be stable. You want to learn things gradually, okay? So uh, this oxide device allows you to do that, okay? So as we discussed, the oxide device, relative switching is caused by moving oxygen vacancies. So, uh, so this is a tantalum pentoxide-based device. So this is our switching layer. This is initially an insulating layer. We have another layer that has oxygen vacancies, okay? This is a TEM. And uh, by applying a negative voltage to the top, we can attract oxygen vacancies to the switching layer. Then we can train the device conductance. Okay, so we can do some simulation. Once again, the red color means high oxygen vacancy. So initially you have this insulating layer. Then after negative voltage some time, then you can attract po uh, this positively charged oxygen vacancies. Then the both film stack become uh, conducting. And uh, um, the circles are experimental device data and the uh, solid lines obtained through the modeling. Okay, so you can indeed e explain the relative switching behavior. So now we have a high returns. Now it's switched to a low resistance state uh, by, uh, through this movement of oxygen vacancies. So you can do this model. You can do a little more detailed model. You can also do a pretty higher level model. So here we use a, a drift diffusion type of model. But we have two types of uh, 
uh, particles have two type of uh, carriers. One is uh, uh, electrons. We use the electrons to transmit the electrical signal. So we still need a continuity equation for electrons, okay? But then we also have ions. We also have a continuity equation for the oxygen vacancies. So the movement of oxygen vacancies affects the local conductivity, which in turn affects the current you get, okay? Uh, so this equation can show the material property, and this material property is reflected by the current you collect, okay? Then uh, if the current is high, you can also, you need to worry about uh, dual heating and temperature change, so you can also account for that. So by self-consistently uh, solving those equations, you can predict this dynamic switching behavior, okay? And you can also get gradual conductance changes. So, uh, so by controlling the amount of ocean vacancy, you move into the switching layer, kind of like controlling the doping concentration in your semiconductor, you can change the conductance incrementally, okay? So here by applying individual set pulses, small set pulses, uh, so this is like, for example, point nine volt, individual set pulses, we can uh, change the conductance incrementally. So these are identical pulses, but after each pulse, we increase the conductance by a small amount. So over time, we can gradually uh, train the device. So that's basically the concept of um, a training. So uh, you can apply a, a, a positive voltage to reset the device. Again, so you can apply a small positive voltage, then you can, each pulse will reset the device by a small amount. They move a small amount of oxygen vacancy away, and over time it can recover the high return state. So, uh, so this is one example. Um, so that's uh, sponsored by another DAPA program. So the idea in, in this case, we want to process incoming images, okay? So, uh, so the idea is that now we build this crossbar, uh, so we apply a voltage pulse as we discussed, then the, uh, the current you collect at the output neuron is then the, the product of this voltage multiplied by the conductance, right? That's only when you have one input neuron. But now we have an array of input neurons. So if you have an image, you can convert the image, 2D image, into an array of one-dimensional vector, okay? You can simply just, um, through topology changes, you can move rows, stitch rows together, and convert this into a one-dimensional input, okay? So your input is, in this case, a one-dimensional vector. So now if I look at the current I collect here, so the current collect, I collect here is this voltage pulse multiplied by this conductance here, this voltage pulse multiplied by another conductance here. So, so the total current is then through this Ohm's law and the Kirchhoff's law, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, mathematically, the current you collect here equals to the input voltage vector multiplied by the weight vector. So you can consider all the conductance values stored so, uh, along this column associated with this neuron as a weight vector associated with this neuron. Then the current you collect equals to the dot product of the input vector with the weight vector, okay? So that's a, a voltage vo uh, vector vector dot product, product. But we can also not only measure this one, we can measure all the output neuron current together, okay, or simultaneously. Then you are basically performing a vector matrix multiplication, right? So each output current is a, a dot product of this input vector with a, a, a specific weight vector associated with a specific output. So it turned out that this vector matrix multiplication is the fundamental multiplication, fundamental operation in machine learning, okay? In fact, you can argue it's a fundamental operation in any system. In, in basically, a MATLAB is based on this vector matrix multiplication, and you can build a general purpose computer with MATLAB, right? So this, and it's pretty much every operation, you can convert them into this vector matrix operation. So now, we don't have to do this multiplication. So in the past, if you want to do this multiplication, you collect the data here, you read the memory from this vector, you read the memory from all the other vector, then you have a multiplier, you perform the multiplier, then you store the output at a separate memory. So now everything is done in the same location, okay? So all we need to do, we don't have to do this multiplication, we just need to read out the current. So we just do a single read from the output current, then we through physics, through Ohm's law and the Kirchhoff's law, the Felix takes care of this multiplication. The current you read out is exactly this vector matrix multiplication, okay? So that turned out to be very, very convenient. So not only don't, uh, do you not have to worry about moving memory into a logic and uh, moving back uh, uh, data into a memory, also you do things very, very efficiently in parallel. So you can get this uh, whole vector matrix multiplication in, one, in a single step. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, mathematically, uh, you can argue that um, uh, the way uh, we are so efficient uh, in 
recognizing face or recognizing a pattern is once again through this pattern matching. And pattern matching is nothing but vector matrix multiplications or vector vector dot products. Because if you have two vectors that are matched, then their dot product will be maximum. If the, their two vectors are orthogonal, they are, they are completely not matched, then their dot product will be zero, okay? So that's how we perform uh, pattern matching. So if you can implement the vector matrix multiplication, you can efficiently implement pattern matching. For example, I have all those features that are in my inputs. If I already have some features uh, stored as the resistances at those cross points along different columns, then if this feature happens to match with this feature, this vector happens to match with this vector, then this, the do, uh, output from this neuron will be maximum. So immediately I know uh, I have a feature associated with this feature at the input, okay? Then what you can do with that, if initially all the weights are random, okay? So by chance, one of the features, this is completely random, but by chance, this feature matches with the input better, then this guy will have a maximum output with a particular feature, then I can apply a so-called update rules. I can update the conductance values because I can update the weights in real time, right? I can update the weights so that it will match better with this specific input. So over time, this neuron will match better with a particular feature. And similarly, other neurons will by chance match with a better with a, another feature in the beginning, and the, during training, they will match better with a, another specific feature. So over time, you can actually train the network to learn different features from input. And you can also use these trained features to perform inference to know what kind of feature you have from input. Then you can process data from that, okay? So I'll, I'll not go into a lot of details here. So we implement this system for uh, image analysis. Uh, in this principle, this is the equation we used. So I'll not go into the details here. So this is the hardware we build. We build this 30 by 32 uh, crossbar array. And uh, so we, uh, we build a test board to test this array. Uh, so this work was just published earlier this year. And so we train the network with this called natural images, right? So natural images are not uh, camouflage, right? So they have certain features, so they don't change. Suddenly, they share common features, for example. They have edges, they have common edges, they have common features among them. So we just use these non-natural images uh, to train the network so that over time, this network actually learns, as we discussed earlier, so it will learn the common features from the Im image, okay? Initially, the weights are random, so the features are random. But over time, if the, you keep feeding the common features, every time the features are different, but they share certain features. So, so over time, some neurons will learn one feature, some other neurons will learn different features. And these features are common from all inputs, okay? And then we can use the learned features to process the uh, uh, original input. So for example, we can take a small patch because it's a small network, we can do, uh, only do one patch at a time but we can take a small patch, we can analyze what kind of feature in there, we can find out which neurons are active uh, associated with which features, and we can reconstruct the image. So the idea is that now if you embed it in a sensor, you can do all those processing on the sensor, okay, on the sensor, because you can do all this analysis without, with very low power and very quickly in parallel. And then you can submit, when you transmit data, you don't transmit your in raw image. You only transmit information of what kind of feature you have in there and the relative strength of the features. Then you can get the new reconstructed image um, based on the transmitted data. So it's, it's going to be much uh, smaller amount compared to the original data, but also it's going to be much more efficient when you can process data in, the, in this pr compressed domain because now you know, already know what kind of, kind of feature you have, okay, instead of some raw data. So another example, uh, it's a similar concept. So, uh, so we use the network to process uh, principal component analysis. So PCA uh, is a similar idea. So, um, so the idea is that, um, for example, in this case, we process data from uh, uh, breast, can uh, breast, breast cancer um, uh, uh, hospital, Wisconsin, Uni University of Wisconsin Breast Cancer Center. So if you suspect if the patient has breast cancer, what do you do? Uh, you subject the patient to, in this case, nine different tests, okay? So for each test, uh, they give the patient uh, uh, the test a score, right? So a single test is not efficient to tell whether this cell uh, is a cancer cell or a benign cell. But the combination of those nine tests hopefully will give you enough data to, um, to tell you if it's a benign or cancer, okay? So the idea is then to reduce the input from this non-dimensional space into a two-dimensional space from uh, the combination of the scores into just zero and one, whether you have a, a benign cell or cancer cell, okay? 
And to do that, what you can do is use this called principal component analysis. So you find out the two major uh, features in this non-dimensional system, okay? Then you project your non-dimensional data along these first uh, two vectors. So uh, then, uh, I'll skip this, I'll show the example. So, so if you, so this is the, the first uh, two uh, major components, so first major engine vectors. You, you project your data along these first major vectors, then uh, if you find the engine vectors properly, then the data can be separated, okay? So this is the original data, uh, the color represents the ground truth. So you can, you can then take the biospay and find out if it's really a cancer cell or not, right? So this is the ground truth, you can really measure it uh, afterwards. But this is the, without measurement, if you don't do training, uh, if you just project it along the original two vectors, obviously all the results are mixed together. But if you train the network properly, you project it along the two principal components, then the two groups of data are separable, okay? Now I can just draw a boundary, then uh, if, I, if my data is located to the left of the, uh, this boundary line, I know it's a cancer cell. If it's located to the right, I know it's a benign cell, okay? So what do we do is that you can, you can solve these engine vectors through brute force. You can, you can solve this matrix and find the engine vectors, or you can use a machine learning approach to learn the engine vectors, okay? You can learn the engine vectors, and in this case, we, we use this machine learning algorithm, we mapped it in our hardware. Okay, so map it into, into this. It's very small, nine by two hardware, okay? Because you have an input is non-dimensional, your output is two, two dimensional, okay? So we train this network. Uh, the, now the, the memory star weights, memory star conductances associated with the two output neurons uh, represent the two uh, um, engine vectors, okay? So we can do the projection. Now we can indeed clearly separate the two groups. So the results we get is almost exact as solving this through, through software. Uh, so I'll go through this very quickly. So, um, so you can do this, you can do learning. So in the very beginning, this is the first paper we published on this topic. Um, you can do learning, you can actually show, you can, the device can emulate the biological system very, very nicely. But uh, if you dig a little further, you'll find out that biological synapses are much more complex. It's, it's more than just a, uh, um, a weight that's tunable, it's more than just a plastic weight. There are a lot of act, um, dynamic processes going on, okay? So I'll skip a lot of details. Um, uh, uh, people talk about all these dynamics, for example, you can have calcium concentration from one spec, the calcium concentration will increase, then it will decay. Then if another spec come in, the overall cal calcium concentration can be above a threshold, then it will trigger some other chemical processes. So that's this kind of train reaction is really causing the synaptic change, okay? So it's really a very complex dynamic system. That's why the device shows very interesting timing-based and uh, rate-based learning. So uh, uh, you can also use the, the, the device to also emulate not just the effect, but also emulate the fundamental dynamic processes. As we discussed, in these devices, when you move the ions, there are also many interesting dynamic processes involved. Your particle can be oxidized on one side, it can be reduced on the other side. You can have different activation energies, you can have some temperature in the device, you can have different time constants in those different devices. So um, in principle, you can actually map these internal processes in biology. So not, not the effects, but fundamental driving processes uh, in these devices. You can really emulate it in a very, very realistic fashion. Okay, so I will, not, I will skip a lot of details, but we did find that uh, it's indeed possible. So we can use a single device to emulate the internal dynamics of a biological synapse, okay? So we published a couple of papers on that, and it's, this also direction is gaining a lot of uh, interest. We call them so-called second-order memory stars because you, you no longer just change ion and say I change the conductance, but in fact you have at least two different processes. They have different time constants. The combination of those two processes the uh, combination of these interdependent processes give you the resistance change, okay? That leads to a very interesting uh, dynamic behavior. So I'll skip all those details. Um, uh, so we have uh, another paper um, under uh, revision uh, which shows that you can also use the, these dynamics directly to do computation, uh, for example. Uh, in this case, we, uh, we can recognize the handwritten digits using a very small network by taking advantage of the dynamic response of the device, okay? Um, so you can also use the device for other type of computation, right? So if you can do vector matrix multiplication, you can do a 
pretty much everything, right? So you can use this as a binary logic. Uh, so in this case, you can build a so-called wired NOR logic uh, on this device and use this to implement uh, a four-bit adder that was published at IEDM a um, couple years ago. You can also build a so-called partial differential equivalent solver. Uh, same thing, you can map pretty much a very large class of problems into this vector matrix multiplications and you can implement it very efficiently in this hardware system, okay? So for example, we can solve a pretty difficult a partial differential equation uh, very efficiently using our system. So this is a one time problem, this is another. Uh, we showed that you can, this is actual, actual results from our small network. Oh, this is a normally a very, very accurate problem. You need high precision, but we showed you can actually deal with this. So this is basically trying to modulate water flow in a shallow water system, and we can use a small network to actually solve this physical problem. And uh, we're not emulating this problem, but we solve the differential equations to get the solutions. So, so these are actual, actual results obtained from our network then just uh, plotted together in this cartoon. Okay. So, uh, so, so, uh, so we, the, the, the final direction we want to go is to actually build a reconfigurable system. So, uh, so now we have those uh, individual functions we can do, uh, but maybe we can build a, 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 a more general purpose system where uh, the devices are the same. So it's the same device, but you can use the same device to either store data or perform neuromorphic computing or arithmetic computing or solve your uh, numerical equations using the same device, using the same interface, right? So what function this group of devices does is completely de determined by the software, right? So in this case, uh, so it's kind of like a reconfigurable system, but we don't physically re reconfigure the, the, the hardware. So the functions are completely defined by the software. It just depends on uh, the blocks are completely defined by software as well. Um, so that's, that's an interesting direction we want to go. And so the idea that you can dynamically reallocate the different parts of the network, uh, different parts of the system, to either perform memory or neuromorphic or any other function depending on your need, okay? Depending on the task and even during the operation, you can dynamically reallocate the resources to really optimize the efficiency. So I feel this can really improve the uh, performance of the system, okay? So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's our dream in the future, okay? Uh, to, to build a, a new computing systems that are not only efficient, but also um, pretty general purpose, not just uh, for a specific task, but can be used to solve many different tasks. Yeah, so that's a summary, and the students, and uh, um, so we're really fortunate to have a uh, uh, DARPA support and a couple of NSF grants and some Air Force support, but very good students. And uh, I was really lucky to have very good students. And also, uh, Muhammad, uh, he did the, he actually came up with this idea, which I, I personally liked a lot. And also, he did the partial differential equations and uh, all the other things. And, uh, and he's also on the market for a faculty position, so I hope uh, I'm trying to do an advertisement for him. Okay. A great, great uh, researcher. Yeah, so lastly, also, I'm at, uh, Alan said I'm the director of the NanoFab, so I just want to give a couple of slides. We have a, a pretty state-of-the-art facility, a 13,000 square feet facility, with 17 dedicated staff to this uh, fabrication facility. So I'm the um, director, and Sanjun, she's a managing director. She handles the day-to-day -day operation of the fab, okay? So, uh, so I have uh, over 400 users. It's really open, so really close. If you guys have some uh, uh, needs that, um, Obviously, you have a, a state-of-the-art fab as well, but if we can also possibly collaborate and we can maybe have some complementary uh, facilities we can enjoy. Um, so yeah, these are the processes we do and uh, some new tools we just got, uh, flip shoot bounder and uh, new ALD system and LMU that, uh, that can be used for just physically edge system rather than through RE, okay? So if you have a magnetic material, this is something you need, okay? All right, yeah, thank you. Yes? For the solar electrolytes, how do the ions move through it? Is it through uh, lattice sites or is it individually? It's, uh, it's a very good question. So it's very difficult for them to move through lattice sites, okay? So in this case, all our films are amorphous. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to move them through a single crystalline film, okay? And uh, people, um, uh, you can use polycrystalline, they move much easier along the green boundaries, right? Uh, it's just much more energetically favorable to have them 
at the green boundaries rather than within a green, okay? So, uh, so we use amorphous because then you still want the film to be uniform. If it's polycrystalline, it's very hard to control the uniformity from device to device. Okay. When you say amorphous, you mean It's really amorphous, yes, yes. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have done um, within 10 nanoseconds. Some other groups have done it uh, within one nanosecond. So from the, from the rising edge of the voltage pulse to when the, the channel is formed. Uh, but there are the trade off. If you move it so fast, the device can be less reliable, okay? Um, you can easily overshoot, you overprogram the device, okay? So we prefer to not program it that fast, okay? The same timing that when you want to actually start actually reset. Yes, yes. Reset can be even faster because reset, um, you can have a temperature come into play because you have already have a channel so the temperature can be high, so that can be even faster. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so um, these things, um, because it's really just the RC delay, right? I mean, it's a, it's a voltage uh, goes through a, a resistor, right? Um, so uh, so they, they, are, uh, they can be very fast. So right now we have, um, we have done like a 10 megahertz. We, our system is operating at 10 megahertz, okay? So which is obviously already much faster than the human brain, which is 10 hertz, right? So, uh, but the other trade-off because um, we consume very little power. So even though each individual neuron is very slow, but we have all those neurons work together, right, in parallel, okay? Um, so if, you, they, if your circuit is too fast, then uh, um, uh, the, the power consumption may be a little high. So that's, all, that's always a trade-off. But uh, I, think, um, it's, it's, I think in the few, next few years, we, it's really, really promising. We can actually build a network that can, um, so right now we, can, we already have it, but it's small scale, but we feel in the next few years we can have a skilled, skilled up system that can really process images and a lot of tasks very, very efficiently. Yes? Um, so imagine the electricity problems with like, the amount of voltage you're forced to create. Yeah, so the voltage is actually not very high, and it depends on how, how high a programming current you use. So, um, uh, if the programming current, for example, uh, is more than, say, 10 microamps, then you do worry about the heating problem, okay? If you really uh, control the material and control the programming condition so that your programming current doesn't really go above, say, 100 nanoamp or below one microamp, you may still have dual heating, but it's actually not significant. So we have done simulation, we have uh, uh, done a little bit of measurement, some other group have done some measurement. So the temperature may rise if the, if the current is high, but it doesn't really reach very high. It doesn't really melt the film. Or it doesn't, for example, it may reach, uh, uh, at say, uh, um, at say, um, one milliamp, right? You may increase uh, temperature by a few hundred, by say, two hundred or four hundred degree. Okay, uh, but it still hasn't melted the device yet. Um, so flash memory is very very low power because it's through tunneling, but it's very slow. Uh, it's very slow. So it. Uh, takes um, hundreds of microseconds to erase the device. But we don't see, that's why when you read the flash memory, right, when you have a memory stick, reading is much faster than writing, right? Because writing is, erasing is very slow. For writing, they have to erase the cell and rewrite it. And that's very slow. And they try to make things in parallel because it takes very little current, so they can try to erase many, the whole block in parallel, okay? They try to hide this effect. Um, uh, so, Overall, uh, we can use the same power. We, 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 so the, that, that's the, for example, for my startup company, we try to use the exact same um, peripheral circuitry as a flash memory. Okay, so we'll use the same power dissipation, but we are going to be at uh, 100, two orders of magnitude faster than their memory. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's uh, typically more than one megavolt per second. Yeah, uh, per centimeter, yeah, yeah, one, one megavolt per centimeter, yes. Yeah. More than that, typically it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's on the order of a few megavolts per centimeter. So the installation will not take 
Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very interesting idea. So when they break down, normally they have like a defect, they have a pinhole or something, right? So when you have a very thin film and a very small device, the breakdown voltage, a breakdown field actually goes up. That's a, so the thinner you make the film, the, the higher the breakdown voltage typically is. Um, it can. Uh, we can store multiple resistance levels, but it's not as um, as nice as this kind of device. Um, it's not as nice as. Uh, if I can go back to the. This slide is very big, so if I can go back to yeah, it's not as this type. So um, you can control the the length of the filament because the filament is very um, the growth is very very nonlinear. Okay, so when the when the filament grows. Um, the resistance is decreased, right? And the field is enhanced because when the filament grows, the, the voltage is dropped into a narrower and narrower region. So the field is, is increased and the growth is speed up even more exponentially, right? So it's really nonlinear. Uh, so you can control the programming condition to get multiple levels, but you don't get this. Um, uh, as, so here we try to just control the number of pulses rather than the amplitude of the pulses. So it, if you, it's, it's easier to just control the number of pulses. That's, that's more natural to implement in a circuit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned that all switching arrangements are transformed. Yes. Yes, yes, kind of like a holes in you know, like a p-type, right? It's really oxygen ions, but you can consider it as oxygen vacancy movement. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really, really, uh, that's, uh, uh, you can say it's diffusion or, or hopping, or like, uh, it's really, um, there's an activation energy, right? And the ion has to overcome this activation energy. And the electric field lowers the activation energy. So they can still, if the activation energy is low, they can diffuse, right? Because thermal energy can just activate the ions, okay? Yeah, this is just diffusion. And yeah. you're not sure exactly what that uh, activation energy is? We can marry it. We can marry it. For different materials, we can marry it. So they actually, uh, we have published papers to, to show how you can marry the activation energy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And do you have one last question? Professor Ben, do you have one last question or no? Uh, <laughs> I saw your hand I up. just wonder, you know, when you're feature training, are you doing factory parallelly or is this single? Uh, we, we do it uh, normally because you, train, you only train the winning neuron normally. Okay, so we, we train the one column, but you train the all the ways in parallel associated with this one column. Yeah. But if you have like 32 by 32, then you have to do 32 Oh no, training takes, uh, normally you, you need, for example, for this image, takes 20,000 training samples, right? So, but every time there's only one or a few winning neurons, okay? Yeah, so right now, for example, in machine learning, it's the same thing, so they, but they train it offline. So they use, uh, a cluster of GPUs to train, right? So, uh, so training is normally very, very uh, slow in this case, and they normally don't do online training. But in our case, we, I, we want to do online training. But uh, uh, training is always slow. You want to train it slowly. You don't want to just jump between, uh, from zero to one. It's not always the case that we have a full audience of half a dozen <laughs> faculty members and, and go over the Q&A oh, session. Uh, <laughs> it tells me that we had an excellent presentation. So yeah. please Great. join me in thanking our Thank speaker you. today. Yeah. Thank you for the great, great audience. Yeah.